Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Kathleen Gibson, and I'd like to welcome you to this case panel discussion about lessons learned in deep venous stenting. And I'm delighted to have an excellent international faculty with us today. So we have uh, Stephen Black, who's coming from the UK, speaking with us. Uh, Kush Desai from Chicago, Illinois, myself from Bellevue, Washington, and Aaron Murphy from Charlotte, North Carolina. So we are all uh, avid deep venous stenters and would like to share with you some of our tips and tricks and knowledge about the world of deep venous stenting. So these are the faculty's disclosures for the four faculty in today's program. And program information, uh, this program has been provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education and supported by an educational grant from Medtronic. We have three main learning objectives for this session. First is to understand the current landscape of stenting in deep veins. Second, to identify when to utilize a stent, how to place a stent that will optimize patient outcomes, and how to intervene if needed to prevent stent migration and reintervention. So I'm gonna kick it off with just a very basic introduction of the current clinical landscape uh, for iliac stenting and some characteristics that are differences between the available stents. So if you were to design a portfolio of the ideal venous stent, this would be a stent that would have a wide range of sizes and lengths to fit different patients' clinical scenarios. It would be strong and able to resist recoil and compression, flexible and able to negotiate the curves of the pelvis without distorting the stented vein. It would be durable and able to withstand repetitive motion without any loss of integrity. And it would be accurate in its deployment. So some aspects of strength that we talk about, the first is chronic outward force. This is the radial force during expansion of the stent, and this occurs even without post-balloon dilatation, and this is the pressure exerted on the vessel wall by the stent. Radial resistive force represents the resistance to recoil, and it occurs primarily after the stent has been post-dilated with a balloon. And then finally, resistance to compression is the ability of the stent to withstand a lateral force. So the current stents in the United States, not all of these are currently available. Uh, the wall stent, the Venovo, the Abre, and the Zilver Vena are all FDA approved available stents. The Vici is an FDA approved stent which was recently removed from the market. And the Vivid Duo is a stent that is in phase three clinical trials and not yet available to everyone. It's not FDA approved. So these stents have different properties. The wall stent is the stent that we've been using for the longest period of time. This is a, has a coaxial deployment, as does the Vici and the Zilver Vena and the Vivid Duo. It is available and approved, and it is a braided Elgiloy stent. It's got a wide range of diameters, and the lengths are 20 to 90 millimeters, so shorter lengths than some of the other stents that we have that are now uh, vein specific. The Vici, uh, which has been recently pulled from the market, was the only nitinol closed cell stent that was being utilized, had a variety of different diameters and lengths as shown here. The Venovo and the Abre are both triaxial deployment. The Venovo, uh, the French size for access is between eight and 10, depending on the size diameter of the stent, whereas the Abre is nine French. These are both open cell nitinol stents with fairly similar ranges of sizes. The Zilver Vena is coaxial, goes through a seven French sheath, the smallest French size, and it is an open cell nitinol stent, not as many sizes on the upper range as the others. And then again, the Vivid Duo is not yet out of clinical trials. So uh, when selecting a stent, first the wall stent is kind of in its own category. This is an Elgiloy closed cell stent. It has high radial force except for the ends of the stent, which tend to be weak and can collapse. It comes in the largest sizes, um, but not as long of lengths. It does tend to foreshorten, which can be a bit of a challenge when you're uh, judging uh, what length to put in. It's crush resistant, but less flexible than some of the other choices and deployment accuracy can be an issue. However, the plus side of this stent is you can recapture it uh, up to a certain point of no return um, and reposition it, which you cannot do with the other stents. So this is a little video clip showing you a uh, wall stent and kind of 
It's a bit of a more stiff stent. It tends to straighten out the vein that it's in. And when it's compressed, it elongates. So this is a closed cell algeloy stent. Uh, these come from multiple manufacturers. They're self-expanding. They resist recoil. They withstand compression well. And one of the main advantages of them is that they're easy to deploy. They tend to land right where you think that they're going to. They foreshorten quite minimally. Uh, they cannot be recaptured, however, like the wall stent can, uh, but they are also another advantage is they're available in longer lengths. And the radial forces with these stents really vary depending on which stent it is that you're putting in. So this is a, a picture of the Vici stent. This is no longer available. And then a movie clip here of me showing you Vici stent. This is a closed cell nitinol stent. This one does tend to kink a bit. It's not quite as flexible as the open cell stents. This is the Venovo stent. This is an open cell nitinol stent and the ends of it you can see have this characteristic flare on both sides. And on this video, I play with this stent a little bit so you can see it. It's quite flexible. It takes curves very nicely. And here I'm just showing you kind of the radial resistive force. This is the Aubre. It's a little heavier than the Venovo. It does not have the flared ends, but it is also an open cell nitinol stent. And it has a little bit more radial outward force than the Venovo. Quite flexible. and takes a little bit more force to compress it. This is the Zilverbina. This is an open cell nitinol stent, quite flexible, but of all the open cell stents has the less radial force. And you can see here, it's quite easy to compress. So in conclusion, there are many choices of stents on the market. The two main materials are Elgiloy and nitinol. There's differences in radial force, sizes, and deployment mechanisms that you should be familiar with when you're using these stents. And uh, it's really important for proper patient selection and understanding how to deploy and to size them. So that's an overview. Um, and we're gonna pause and just chat before we go to the next section. So I would just uh, ask the panel, maybe I'll start with Dr. Uh, Murphy. Uh, when you are deciding what kind of stent to place in a patient, what things are you thinking about of, of what stent you might want to use? Yeah, thanks, Kathy. I think um, you touched on a bit of it, you know, depending on the, the scenario that you're up against, a lot of the patients I treat are post-thrombotic. So having a stent that I can precisely land at the profunda um, is important to me. So the ability to predictably and precisely deliver a stent um, you know, if there's, if there's a uh, cable involvement, there's only certain stents available that are large enough size. I think about um, the post thrombotic patients need, I think a bit more radial resistive forces in order to um, combat the tough scarring. Um, so those are some of the decisions I make when I'm, you know, thinking about which stent to use. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Black, what kind of things did you have to think of when you went from uh, using wall stents to um, uh, using these newer venous dedicated stents? Oh, I think the biggest thing is the technique is different. It's uh, you don't deploy them in the same way. They don't behave in the same way when you deploy them and the sizing parameters are different. So I think if you if you go straight from using wall stents and use exactly the same uh, thought process that has been taught and most people would go from what Raju has been talking about for many years, you're going to get into trouble with the nitinol stents. And the same thing is if you did nitinol stents and went to wall stents and tried to deploy in the same way, you similarly, you would get problems. I think the important thing is to understand how the stents behave and your videos, you know, are instructive for that. I think people playing with stents gives you a good idea of, of what they do. So uh, the first thing is you don't need to oversize like wall stent to the same extent, although you have to get the sizing right. So not oversizing doesn't mean putting in a small stent. It means putting in the correctly sized stent. It's a bit like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Goldilocks and the three bears. 
you know, not too big, not too small, just right. That's the that's the, the point of sizing. And then, uh, you know, you've got the longer lengths, which deploy accurately, and that's really helpful. So you can be more uh, conscious of not covering the contralateral limb. Uh, so those are the main the main things is just changing your technique to to be familiar with the product. And then I have one more question before we move on for Dr. Desai. If you have somebody that's used to using either a triaxial uh, deployment and has never used a coaxial uh, stent before, do you have any pieces of advice for them for placement with the it, differences? Yeah. So the, the the coaxial stents that are currently available are quite a bit stiffer, and I've personally feel that you almost have to push the first part out a little bit and it forms that martini glass shape. And when you have that martini glass shape, you still can reposition it. You don't want to push it forward. I always start a little bit higher than I intend to have my final landing position. Um, it's the same idea with the triaxial stent, but of course you don't have, there's none of that um, initial release of static friction that you have to have before you deploy the rest of the stent. So with the coaxial stent, you just have to be mindful of that if you try and pin pull, I, I know the first time I tried to do it, I was a little too low and then I had to extend it up. Um, I recognized it right then and I had to place a second stent. Um, with a triaxial stent, you don't, you simply don't need to do that. So, you know, uh, consistent with what Steve just said, each one behaves a little bit differently at deployment. So you just have to be aware of it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and so the, we're, I'm going to turn the next talk over to Dr. Black, and he's going to talk to us about tips and tricks for successful intervention using stents. Uh, thanks, Kathleen. And uh, obviously, it's a great pleasure to join all of you on the panel. Um, so I think when I think of tips and tricks for venous stenting, the first place you've got to start is learning about venous disease. Uh, you have to understand the data for treatment. So, and that, that's about who to treat, who not to treat, uh, what's out there, what information is out there about venous stenting. I think one of the biggest mistakes I've seen is people go from treating arterial disease and simply assume you can move across to treating veins. And uh, I've often made the analogy that it's like playing squash and tennis, so a racket sports with a ball, but the rules are different and you have to know those different rules. You have to learn the techniques. And I think, we just touched on that with the difference between wall stent deployment and, and what nitinol stents do. And you can't simply take what you know about nitinol uh, wall stent, for example, if you've done that a couple of hundred times and expect that you can do exactly the same thing with a nitinol stent, they're going to be different. And then each of the stents are different. I think uh, I've had very good experience with the Vici stent over many years. I've had good experience with the open cell nitinol stents as well. And uh, you know, our data doesn't show any particular difference in performance between those stents. And that's related to, to knowing how each of them behave and, and using them appropriately. I think the biggest thing for me in venous disease was spending time with people who've done it and been there before. So you make novel mistakes. There's no point in making old mistakes. So, you know, we know the things that you can avoid and you should avoid them. Then make novel mistakes because everybody's going to do it and come and teach everybody else so that we learn from that and, and we keep moving on. Uh, and I spent, uh, I'd say Peter Neglin was probably most instructive in getting me on in venous disease. I spent a lot of time with Peter in the beginning and he came to my center quite a bit and was hugely supportive. And in the early stages, Jerry O'Sullivan and Neil Speckhardt, um, along with a few other people, Rick de Graaf, uh, and Neil Cocker were hugely influential on my practice. And as that's grown, I've spent a lot of time talking to other people, Kush Desai, uh, Aaron Murphy, both on this call, yourself, Kathleen, we, you know, we spent a great deal of time discussing treating patients. And, you know, I'd say that I fairly frequently will text Kush or Aaron or Jerry and ask them about a patient guy. I, you know, what do I do with this patient? We've had a problem. Yeah. What do you think? You know, and I think you've got to accept that it's continuous and be humble enough to be continuously learning from your peers and, and seeking out knowledge. Uh, the second thing you got to do is build a team in your hospital who are going to treat these patients properly. And venous stenting is not just simply banging in stents into somebody who's got a swollen leg. There's a whole uh, range of patients who need treatment, and many of them have complex problems. So you need to have a bunch of people who are going to treat them with you, and it's not a solo pursuit. And it's not a solo pursuit for a number of things. You, if you make a mistake and you've got a team backing you up, it's much easier to recover from that. And it doesn't matter what kind of error that's going to be, you can call on help. And I've got a, a great team of colleagues from hematologists um, to uh, other vascular surgeons, uh, uh, ultrasound scanning technicians, nurse specialists, and uh, 
interventional radiology colleagues, and we all work together to treat our patients, not only the first time, but also inevitably when you're doing re-interventions or other things come up, and it is a, a team pursuit. Uh, the third bit of it is you have to change your pathways and you have to change your decision-making. So the pathways are about introducing standard pathways to your hospital so that you get patients to you, not only to treat, but also to follow up and manage. So one of the things I saw early days in venous stenting was people would put a stent into an acute or chronic DVT patient and not see them again. And because you don't have that same uh, problem that you have in arterial disease, where if your stent blocks overnight, the leg is ischemic again the next day, all that's happened is the patients don't feel any different. And you go, well, that looks fine. You go home. And if you haven't scanned that, the first time you know there's a problem, and as the patient comes back a couple of months later and says, yeah, I don't feel any different. My leg's the same. And you scan them and the stent's blocked. And then it's very difficult to do something about it. So your pathways for both getting patients and following up need to be changed. And you also have to think about the decision making on that. You know, I think that the real pressure in venous disease is a combination of things from untreated patients who've had years of mistreatment to uh, complex disorders to the ease to make a diagnosis based on imaging that may not be true. Uh, and, you know, I read this book called The House of God when I was studying. Uh, I'm sure many people know it, but the quote that has always stuck with me from The House of God which is probably stolen from Voltaire to some extent, but it is the art of medicine is do as much nothing as possible. Uh, and, you know, it's really, it's really true. You know, even when we're pushing the boat out in innovations, you've really got to be sure that your patient needs that uh, treatment or, or that intervention in the first place. Because if you don't do something to them, then nothing can go wrong from anything you've done. Uh, the, the fourth part about this is obsessing about detail. It's not just, putting in a stent. And a lot of the mistakes with venous stenting is contemplating that the venous stent itself is the panacea. You have to think about access. If you access the common femoral vein, you're going to miss disease. If you access the great saphenous vein and try and lyse patients with uh, femoral popliteal vein thrombosis, you're going to miss disease. Uh, you need to think about using IVUS, which I think has made a, a massive difference to practice. You've got to look at profunda inflow. You've got to look at uh, anticoagulation and get that really spot on and tight. I mean, simple things like taking sheaths out in the operating theater, not leaving patients to go back to the ward to have the sheath removed at some point afterwards, which was a real legacy of arterial treatments you can't do in veins. And then you've got to think about your stent landing and stent sizing. And I think, uh, you know, you've got to look at making sure you can see in this bottom picture, although it's not clear, but you can see the, the line that the, the wire is following in a lateral view of the patient. You need the stent to come out into this upward pointing segment of the vein so it's not sitting steep down in the pelvis. And that's particularly important with uh, the nitinol stents because they do straighten a little bit. That's the nature of nitinol. And then they can start to tent and straighten at this bend in the bottom of the pelvis. You don't want that. You've also got to look at overlap loans, zones of the ligament. This, this sort of problem with stent fracture is in a large part about inappropriate overlap or positioning of short, small stents underneath the ligament, which don't respond well. And that's exactly what's happened here. It's not, it's not really the stent so much. It's the technique of using it that was more of an issue. Um, and, you know, what we know is that if you look at things like stent migration, uh, small diameter, short stents are the things most likely to move. So if you're treating a nibble patient and you're thinking about putting in a 40 or 60 millimeter, 14 mil or less stent into the patient, don't do it. Go and put it back on the shelf and take something else. That's the basic, simplest answer to that problem. And that will stop probably 90% of stent migrations, not all of them, but if your bigger stents move, you, you've got to ask yourself whether you needed it in the first place. And then, you know, following up your patients, I've learned a lot from just following them up. And, you know, if I reflect on my early practice, we made a lot of technical errors in, in particularly the more complicated uh, patients. And Erin uh, and I, um, have, in going through the data from the Abre study, which Erin presented beautifully at uh, Charing Cross uh, a couple of weeks back, uh, there was, you know, the main issue that came from looking at the failures in that study were technical errors that could probably have been avoided. So again, it comes back to the stent is not the panacea. And once you've eliminated the technical errors, you can sort out clotting in a lot of patients, particularly with novel anticoagulants. And then you're worrying about flow. And that's difficult. But at least then it, that's a patient selection decision. If the inflow is poor and you think it's not going to work, your option is not to stent that patient at this stage. And that's a, a much better decision 
than making a technical error by putting in the wrong stent or the wrong combination of stents. And, and we all see multiple pictures on social media where, frankly, you look at three or four stents stuck in a, an iliac segment, all of 60 to 90 millimeters, multiple overlap zones. I would say all of that is, is avoidable technical error that would prevent half the problems that we, we often talk about. And we are prone as physicians to blame the product for our failures rather than reflect on ourselves. And I think it's an important thing to do that differently. And then the final bit of that is repeat all of that. Once you get to the end, if you start thinking you're great at this, uh, medicine is a great uh, hubris buster and you'll be taught that you've made a mistake or you've got a, an error or you've done something stupid and you'll learn from it again. So, you know, I think you've got to reflect in your own practice. Every time you have a mistake, go back and learn some more, talk to people again, understand the problems and the difficulties you're facing and don't ask people about them to try and learn from them. I think one of the things that struck me most about becoming a senior surgeon often or a senior interventionist, whether you're interventional radiology, cardiology, whatever you may be, is we seem to get to this point in our careers where we think we're trained and then we stop focusing on learning from other people. Uh, you know, even Roger Federer has a tennis coach. So why do we why do we do that? Why don't we go back and keep learning from people or get other people into your operating theater? I've benefited hugely from having people come visit me or going to visit them and seeing things that they do different that have influenced my practice. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm enormously grateful to all those people uh, who have provided that along the way, some of whom I've mentioned in this, but there's there's many others that have contributed to hopefully stuff that benefits my patients in the long run. And I look forward to uh, the rest of this. Okay, so just a, just a few uh, questions before we go on to Dr. Desai's talk. So um, one thing that I want to discuss, we, we talked about under, you know, too, too short or too small of stents, but you also touched on, um, you know, if you have a bigger stent that migrates, maybe that patient didn't need a stent at all. So I think hmm. one problem that people sometimes have um, when they are uh, using IVIS or venography is that they they miss the true size of the vein where it's kind of pancaked. And what yeah. happens with IVIS is that you get a wire bias so that the IVIS is on one side and then you lose the size of the vein, yeah. the width of the vein. And, um, you know, so I think a few tips from my point of view, and we can see what other people have them is you can actually make sure you have a soft wire, pull back the wire to try to get the IVIS more centered, make sure the patient's hydrated, um, all of those things. And, you know, if you can't see the vein to size, maybe it's a really big vein and you shouldn't be there. And I just wanted yep. the panel to kind of go through, what do you do? This would apply to a nivel patient of making so, sure so, you've got the right size. So Kathleen, I think there's two things that, that I do with nivel patients in particular. One is I totally ignore the common iliac vein and compression point. If it's a significant compression, I size the stent in the external iliac vein and I'm really relying on a long stent that's going to be held by the external iliac vein and pinched a bit by the Maytherna point. But the, the common iliac vein is irrelevant to me because it's normally in a genuine uh, nivel lesion, has a degree of pre-stenotic dilation, and it's bigger than it should be. So if you try and size off that, you're going to get the stent. It's going to be all over the place. So you always have not great wall apposition in the common iliac vein, but your purchase from the stent is in the external iliac, which is why I come around the pelvis and I can't see the downside of doing that. I, I know you're covering the internal iliac vein, but I've never understood the downside of, of doing that. I just, you know, there might be a, you might have one or two patients that you can't access the internal iliac vein if you need to later, but those are in my practice are, are pretty uncommon. So I, I'm not worried about that in the, the sense of wide cell structure you can normally get through. Uh, and the second, um, thing that you do is if you're not sure about a nibble, bearing in mind that we're always assessing patients lying on their back, is I will inflate a 14 or a 16 balloon, high pressure balloon to two or three millimeters of mercury, just so it's fully expanded. I'll start it up in the IVC and I'll pull the balloon down through the venous segment into the common femoral vein. And if it doesn't get held up or obstruct or waste at any point in that journey, there's nothing significant there to treat, even if it looks slightly pancaked. And you combine that with absence of collaterals or other symptoms, you've got to be extremely cautious about treating a patient like that because the veins are largely normal. And then, you know, if you valsalva, the stents are not being held and they're going to move. So those are the two things I really focus on. Size in the external iliac vein, use a long stent, 
and use a balloon to really be sure that you've actually got a stenosis. I mean, I think Steve hit it right on. That's exactly how I do it. Um, the only additive thing I can say is that if anything, what Steve said also speaks against the whole idea of the 50% area stenosis. You can't measure the area of a compressed vein. You don't see the entirety of the vein. If you don't see the entirety of the ellipse, you can't measure the area. So in, in my mind, that that's what invalidates the long held belief of 50% area stenosis being the clinical determinant of needing to place a stent in an appropriately selected patient. So this is where video comes in and we're gathering more data and 61% minimal diameter stenosis sized, as Steve just said, not to the common iliac vein, but to the reference extra iliac vein that is normal. That is that is the key um, to not undersizing or frankly oversizing. All right, and Aaron, uh, Aaron do you have anything else to add? Yeah, the only, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, I don't, again, I don't treat a ton of Maytherner or Nivel patients that have a completely normal vein below. I think that's typically a patient who doesn't need a stent. Uh, patients who have been subjected to higher pressures for a prolonged period of time, they generally have a more sclerotic vein below. So one of the things that I do in addition to what they've mentioned already, which I agree with everything, is in a nivel patient, if you really want to see if this anatomic versus pathologic is do a, a significant breath hold. Um, in Valsalva, you get varied responses based on the patient's body habitus, but in breath hold, you'll get a pretty good um, venous dilation. And so if that, if that area under the Maytherner, the area in the common iliac vein below the Maytherner significantly expands, that's a pretty normal vein because disease veins don't do that. Um, so I'd be very cautious to stent that patient. And I think it's a good way to look at, do you really have a, I've seen cave, people say cable stenosis. No, it's just collapsed um, or a Maytherner. It's a good, it's a good way to sort that out. Yeah, and, and I'll kind of go back to hydration too, is if you have someone that's been fasting because you are going to be sedating them, a lot of times they're very dry, they are uh, will be collapsed. And I can tell you that with my patients I have, as soon as they have an IV started, they get a liter of fluid before they go back. And I think that helps as well. Um, we are gonna move on to Dr. Desai is gonna talk to us, give us a case of acute iliofemoral deep venous thrombosis. Thanks, Kathy, um, Steve, Aaron, it's great to be with all of you, hopefully together in person soon. Um, I guess I drew the long straw in presenting a successful case. <laughs> so I'm fortunate to present a successful case that could have easily presented an unsuccessful case as well. Um, this is an acute iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis and hopefully cover some um, important determinants uh, of uh, having a successful procedure. So this patient was a recent patient, 67 year old female, two and a half week history of edema and intermittent left lower extremity pain following a fall on the day of the fall, she had an episode of syncope, came to the ED because of the syncopal event and was found to have a subtle saddle PE. Started on an oxyparin, did not have advanced PE intervention, was not submassive by any of the criteria, ESC, AHA, or whatever you would subscribe to. But um, the, the, the focus shifted from her pulmonary embolism to this pain and edema in her left lower extremity that made ambulation or activities of daily living very difficult. She had had really only minimal improvement with anticoagulation and compression. This is a typical duplex exam that you would see in such a patient, completely occlusive, nary a flow channel through this, uh, a, a totally occlusive uh, iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis. In my center, um, to, to aid with triage, we often get CT scans here. So that's exactly what we did um, to assess the, the cranial extent of thrombus and evaluate for any causative factors. And, you know, certainly the most common on the left lower extremity is going to be the typical, quote, Maytherner iliac vein compression syndrome. But, uh, you know, we see enough of these patients that you may be surprised. There could be a filter, there could be a pelvic mass. It's important to look at all of those other things because it very well could change the, the tenor of your intervention and what you decide to do. I'm gonna apologize for this going fast and it appears I might be able to actually slow it down. So here, as we come down, you see there's perhaps a compression here that'll need to be looked at a little bit more closely with IBIS. And then as you get down, the vein is very acutely expanded. There's stranding the fat around it. That's from a phobitis and inflammatory change that we see with acute DVT, and as we go down, the, the common femoral vein is also very expanded and filled with clot as well. 
Um, so I like to do these procedures prone, um, exactly what Steve said in his uh, talk. Uh, if you if you were to access this in the common femoral vein or the great saphenous vein, you're not going to clear the disease in the most critical segments, uh, which is the common femoral vein, the profunda, and then certainly you're there. You might as well clean out the fem pop to optimize the info as well. Um, that would certainly be the best practice. Uh, so we do left pop, 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 popliteal fossa access. I typically like to do small saphenous or posterior tibial access. Uh, and when I say posterior tibial, it's not by the ankle. It's high calf, um, usually a few centimeters from uh, the popliteal vein. A 10 French sheath allows broad compatibility with all of your devices, thrombectomy and stent. Um, and you can go up to 11 or 12 if you're using some of the, the newer devices or up to 16 if you're gonna use one of the clot capture devices. And I keep my patients on anticoagulation. Um, uh, and in this case, it was an oxyparin. So this is the initial picture. Uh, it's obviously quite acute. You don't see the, uh, the axial collateralization. If this was chronic, quite frequently, you would see perforators lighting up that swing collateral to in, in the adductor hiatus, Hunter's canal, that then connects with the profund at the level, level of the lesser trochanter. We don't see any of that, so this is, uh, this is acute. And then as we go up higher on the image on the right, you'll see that um, I'm doing this run from just below where the profunda is entering. Uh, you have expansile clot within the common femoral vein. So what I did is, um, you know, a lot, we, we go back and forth on this, whether we still need to use um, uh, Alteplase or not. Uh, I personally, uh, 10 milligrams is a very low risk thing. That's one of the things that we can actually take back from a tract and see that in 692 patients, half of those got TPA. There was no gusto five bleed whatsoever. The, the major bleeding rate was 1.7% or lower. So in general, lytics um, at a lower dose are probably pretty safe in the appropriately selected patients, which is what you wanna do in these scenarios. You don't wanna take a very critically ill patient or a patient with a lot of comorbidities that may not derive benefit from this. Um, so I still like to use all place, but that practice might change uh, certainly as our thrombectomy devices are getting better and better. And then I did three, um, after letting the, the, the lytic sit for 30 minutes, I did three passes with a, an eight French lytic thrombectomy catheter. And we get very, we get nice cleanup of the, of the fem pop segment, as you see on the left. And then on the right, uh, most importantly, we've cleaned out the common femoral vein. You can see the profunda branches there. Um, uh, are not, have no thrombus in it whatsoever. So we have a nice uh, cleanup of the inflow and now we can focus on the outflow. What I would point out is that in the uh, common iliac segment up at the level of the sacrum on the image on the right, uh, I don't tend to worry about cleaning that up too much because I'm, I'm committed to stenting this patient. I know that there's gonna be some chronic changes here, but we're gonna confirm that with IVUS before we do anything uh, permanent with the stent. So we use the IVUS to assess for that causative lesion, mark the cranial landing zone of your stent. Once you've decided the, the cranial landing of your zone of your stent, I lock the table um, in that position uh, so that the parallax doesn't change and I can deploy the stent off the bony landmarks because that's what you end up doing. Uh, in all cases, you don't deploy your stent with IVUS. And then um, one thing, and I'll be interested to see what the panel thinks about this. I find that you really can't use IVUS to size a stent personally. I don't feel you can in an acute thrombotic, the vein is expanded or there may be post-thrombotic segments. And so it really is up to your best judgment. Um, you can't measure the contralateral iliac vein all that often because um, as we've heard, Steve and I have heard many times from Nikos Labropoulos, you have um, asymmetry in the size of the iliac veins in people. And certainly in chronic post-thrombotics, the other iliac vein is compensatorily dilated. So you can't use that to size your stent um, either. So it really is your best guess. And in most cases um, in the iliac vein of acute thrombotic, I'm placing a 14 millimeter stent. So we do our IVUS here. And as we go down, you'll see that there is a, there is a compression here and you can see the, the, the halo uh, around the vein wall. So this is clearly inflamed from the thrombotic process. Um, there's some narrowing down there. And then this, it is important to realize that this is not all clot. This is also just static flow within the vein. And I'll, I'll, I'll let it play in real time so you can see it's kind of this snowstorm appearance here. And that's what you see very frequently in these um, acute thrombotic or post-thrombotic patients before you've reestablished re inline flow, that the blood is, uh, the, the, the red blood cells are clumping. That causes that snowstorm appearance that's called Rouleau flow. And that fortunately disappears once you're done with your intervention as we'll show in a second. So I pre-dilate to my expected stent diameter. Uh, I'd, I'm gonna place a 14 millimeter stent in this patient. Um, so I pre-dilate with a 14 by 60 balloon, and then I place a 14 by 150 stent. 
and you'll see right here. Um, I've locked, I've decided that I want to land my stent right around, I believe in this case, it was uh, close to this corner of the vertebral body right here. And I'm slowly pulling it back. Um, this was marked with IVUS. IVUS is critical for helping me land my, pick my landing zone. But once I've picked it and I've taken my IVUS catheter out, that is then referenced uh, so that I know exactly where on my bony landmark, I'm gonna land the cranial end of my stent. Uh, then post dilate, and then I do uh, mandatory to do your post stent ibis as you come down. And as we come down from the vena cava, you'll see that we no longer have that snowstorm appearance. Um, that's all cleared out. We've reestablished flow from the common femoral vein and the profunda and the fem pop segment all the way to the IBC. So um, we're satisfied with this result. That's the final run. So this patient was discharged on anoxaparin and, uh, and clopidogrel. Uh, we can go back and forth on whether Plavix is needed or any antiplatelet is needed. Um, I like to do it at least for 90 days. Um, there really is not great data on it, but uh, hopefully that's forthcoming. Uh, she's instructed to continue compression. When she comes back for a one-month follow-up, her swelling is completely resolved. She's not able to walk. She actually walked her appointment uh, four miles uh, per day without limitation. So very nice uh, and happy response for the patient. And this is the, the post uh, CT scan. You can see that our, our stent landed in the position that we wanted it to. I'll slow it down right here. And as we come through right here, you'll see that um, as, as Steve and uh, Kathy pointed out earlier, you get a really precise placement. It's like exactly right where the compression site would be. And then we have a nice, uh, we have a nice contrast comp going through it. Great, thanks. All right, that's that's really a great case. So I think that one thing that we could discuss briefly before we go on to Dr. Murphy's case is the importance of anticoagulation, and you you know brought that up. And I know that uh, Stephen, that you are fortunate; you have hematologists helping you um, with anticoagulation. And certainly at our facility, that's not happening. I don't know if that's as common in the United States, but I think that um, I would say that uh, we all need to make sure that if we don't have a hematologist or someone helping that we're very kind of familiar with the different anticoagulation choices. And sometimes you actually have to tailor them a little bit to different um, patient scenarios. So, uh, but I think that you, you certainly would hate to have a beautiful result like that and not have good patient education and have them stop anticoagulation and then come back with the thrombosis. So any um, recommendations from the panel on patient follow-up and kind of having a uh, good commitment with the patient with having something like anoxaparin and getting them to do injections for a period of time. Any comments? Um, uh, Kathy, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've pondered that from the patient by and in some respects, having to have an injection and having to come back to have your levels checked with Coumadin or the vitamin K uh, based drugs um, does create a different compliance uh, with patients than taking a tablet that doesn't get measured and you can carry on with life as normal. Uh, I'm not sure there's a huge amount of data to support that, but it does seem to be a, an experience that we have. And our practice is generally two weeks of low molecular weight heparins followed by uh, warfarin in our case for the first um, six months. And then we transition patients to a DOAC at that point once everything's stable and we're happy that there's, there's no other issues. And there's some experimental data to support uh, low molecular weight heparin and warfarin, although it's weak, admittedly. But I think whatever you do, the principle is make sure your patient's anticoagulated from the moment you finish the procedure to the, the time you follow them up. The, the, there's so many patients, I think, who just don't get adequate anticoagulation in that periprocedural period. And by the time you look at them, it's already started as a thrombose and you've missed that window. So it's really tight anticoagulation from, from the table. And we get the ACT up to above 200 when they finish. They leave the operating theater with stockings and Floatron uh, intermittent pneumatic compression on. And they get their first dose of a low molecular heparin in recovery before they go back to the ward. So that you know, they, they are really tightly anticoagulated at that initial phase. Mm -hmm. Okay, any, any other comment? I agree with all of that. And I think that there's, you're gonna find variable uh, treatment algorithms. And for, for nibbles, I, I actually just use antiplatelet on nibbles uh, unless there's something uh, funky going on. 
but I tend to do three weeks. I always do three weeks of anoxaparin with the patients if I can, can get them to do it. Uh, you know, or I, I talk with them about the big investment that they have made in having a procedure done and that you don't want it to fail. And, um, you know, for a long time I did Coumadin. There's some patients where I'm doing a DOAC, usually the L, uh, Apixaban, because it's twice a day. I'm doing a little more, uh, kind of baby stepping towards that. But, you know, until we have data, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think that the one thing is making sure that your patients are taking their medication consistently, no matter what regimen you pick. What I would just to echo, um, Kathy, what you said, if you can find a hematologist to partner with, and Steve has at his center, and I'm sure Aaron has, um, if you can find a hematologist, and when I mean hematologist, um, with all due respect to hematologist oncologists, but a true benign hematologist, um, it's just, there's a, there's, there's a profound difference. I mean, this is what, yep. they, this is what they do. So yep. I found one and I'm holding on <laughs> for dear life. <laughs> Telling them not to move or retire. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's uh, Kush's last point there is, is spot on. Um, the, the, the hematology colleagues I have are all from both the specialists. That's what they do. They don't, they don't, do leukemia or other on oncological hematological their, their focus is thrombosis and it you know you can i'm not a thrombosis uh doctor right so uh, I, i'm good at what i do and you recognize the strengths of the team and you bring it to them i've learned a hell of a lot from them i think i have a good understanding of it but you know they really know what they're doing and that's what they do day in and day out so it does make a difference Okay, I think we're going to move on from that uh, case with the, the great outcome to uh, what to do when a case goes wrong. And this is going to be uh, Dr. Aaron Murphy. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. We're going to discuss Venus case gone wrong. And, you know, I, I actually had many different to pick from. And this normally would not be the case I would pick because it's uh, hopefully a very infrequent complication if you're doing these cases correctly. Um, but in light of current times and, and stents being pulled off the market because of it, um, I think it's very important to discuss now. So we're going to talk about a case of stent migration. Um, this case I became kind of involved in after the fact, but I think it's still worth going through. Um, this patient is a 48-year-old female um, with uh, originally presenting with bilateral edema left with slightly worse than right. She also complained of some itching and burning per reports. Her BMI was 30. Uh, she had non-contributory past medical and surgical history. Her initial venogram um, and IVUS was performed at an outside facility. They determined an 80% May Thurner. They, they said that her veins were otherwise normal and they did use IVUS for stent selection. What was interesting is they initially selected an 18 by 60 millimeter stent to treat an isolated May Thurner, um, but they didn't have the proper inventory for that stent. So they uh, thought they could get away with a 16 by 60 millimeter stent. Um, they then pre-dilated um, to the size of the intended stent um, as you should with a 16 by 40 Atlas balloon. Um, and unfortunately, almost immediately after after deployment of their stent, it migrated into the IVC, into the thoracic component. Um, they attempted to retrieve it at the time and were unable, so they secured it in place with a 24 millimeter wall stent and the patient was transferred uh, to our center for high higher level of care. What that led to um, was we were able to retrieve the wall stent by snaring it and removing it endovascularly through the right common femoral. Um, but when the attempt was made to do the same with the nitinol stent, the nitinol stent broke uh, quite easily into multiple small pieces. And as those pieces were attempted to be snared and removed, um, it became more and more difficult as they continued to fracture into smaller components. Um, so at this point, after removing most of those fragments, um, the proximal portion of the stent was left in place. Um, Postoperatively, the patient was imaged uh, to ensure it was in the, in the same location and the patient uh, you know, had extensive discussions with the surgeon who was involved at the time 
and they decided she was quite adamant that it be removed. Um, so they elected to remove it with open surgery. Um, so she had her um, stent removed and you can see here, um, and she did well quite at, quite well after. Um, however, she now is recovering from a large open surgery um, and had no improvement in her baseline symptoms of bilateral um, edema. So when we talk why first in general, why do stents migrate? And we've covered a lot of this already. Um, often it's a sizing problem. It always is a sizing problem. The stent diameter is too small for the uh, intended vein. The stent length is too short, so it doesn't have enough length of purchase. Um, so it's subjected to moving, particularly if it does not go into the external iliac. Um, often we see in these cases that IVUS was not used for stent selection, although in this particular case it was. And very frequently, these sizing errors are in combination with patients who really don't need a stent um, and are, are subjected to decision-making that was um, appropriate for arterial patients. Let's stent as little as possible and let's look for a 50% uh, lesion. And unfortunately, if you stent a normal vein, even if the May Thurner is quite profound, even if it was 80% in this patient, uh, if you stent a normal vein, when you have Valsalva or you breath hold, this is a capacitance vessel, it's going to expand and that stent will move. Um, so in this particular patient, uh, we can look at this post-op CT at the size of their, their veins. Um, and you can see part of the reason they elected to proceed with taking it out was the cava above the stent. And you'll see the stent here that's lodged just above the renals. Um, the cava gets quickly very big. Um, as you go down below, here you see the cava below the stent that migrated and watch as it goes into the iliac. There's almost no narrowing or May Thurner there. Um, and this vein is quite large and it stays relatively large and healthy all, all the way down. When you take axial slices and you measure, it's not as good as having the initial ivus, but under the artery is measuring 12 to 13 millimeters is the May Thurner. Um, a little bit lower, 16, a little bit lower, 17. And the stent that was selected that goes about to where the, the 17 is, it is, or just past that is a, again, it was a 16 by um, 60 millimeter stent, short and it's too small. There's little apposition there. So when you ask yourself, why does this happen? All of those um, things can be summed up with judgment errors and a lack of knowledge and a lack of experience. So do we have to replace the user before continuing? Um, the answer is probably not, uh, but we need to make sure that before people are selling these products and advising on sizes before interventionalists are putting them in, that there's some degree of education that this is not an arterial stent, that these um, how to size them properly, how to do these cases, or we're going to be headed in the direction of these IVC filters, but frankly, it's happening a lot faster. Uh, this was a decade after. We're now pulling stents off the market, uh, you know, a, what, a year after initially appearing. So maybe two, I guess. Um, so tips to prevent this particular stent migration problem, um, we've covered again, you can't use isolated short stents. You need longer stents. You need them well into the external at a minimum. You don't want to undersize them. Um, use IVUS for stenting and, and uh, stent selection. And treating isolated May Thurner uh, with an otherwise normal vein should be done with caution. This is often anatomic, not pathologic, and you need to be able to tell the difference. Um, remember, migration is not the only stent complication. It's not even the most common that we see. Um, in my practice, I see secluded stents from inflow issues most often, um, but I also see jailing of contralateral veins with DVT. I see jailing of the profunda. 
um, where the stents taken too low and those stents are difficult to keep them open. I see now stents, as Steve mentioned, these stents straighten the vein. So when you use these 60 millimeter, 80 millimeter stents, they're often at the bend on the left side. And this one's a little bit different, but you can imagine it vice versa. If it lands right at the curve distally or proximally, they eat through the vein. And I, I've now had several of these patients um, from these short nitinol stents. Um, so we'll, we'll stop here and kind of discuss if anyone has anything to add, but I think education is our biggest challenge here. That was great, Aaron. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I do have one kind of philosophical question for the, the panel with a lot of discussion that has gone on with stent migration. I've heard um, some others say, well, if a stent migrates, if it's like a 14 or a 16, that is proof that the patient did not need an intervention. We are saying um, if you extend into the external, external, it is safer because you have it pinned. But um, the person who has this viewpoint would argue, okay, you shouldn't have to extend if they really needed the, if they really needed the intervention because it should be pinned at the top if they really needed it. So, what is your viewpoint on that? Can you place a shorter stent in a uh, nibble safely? My answer is one hundred percent no. Uh, for multiple reasons, uh, but one of them is that one, you, you don't, you no longer have it pinned uh, by that May Therner. You've now treated that May Therner. Um, you need a long segment of that vein to really pin it in place. Um, and your, your segment right before that May Therner, if you truly have a somewhat normal vein below it, is going to actually be a little bit larger. So it, it's not going to be fully pinning it. And then lastly, um, I would say 90% of the stents on the left side, if you put a 60 or 80, are going to land at the bend and put that patient at risk of future complications. The problem mm. is that when you look in that AP view, it looks beautiful. Look at my beautiful stent that lands right where it's supposed to. And then you put it in a lateral view and that stent is going gonna, is gonna to kink and it's going to straighten further with time. So by the time they get to me and the patient's saying they're no better, it's because it's eating through that wall or it's jailing the external. And then docs take their patients off their anticoagulation. So now you have a stent jailing the EIV, they're off their anticoagulation and you're getting, you know, clot below it. And you have something complex to fix that was super easy by just taking a stent into that external iliac vein. Uh, I just fundamentally disagree with that. I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you kept, that secret we'll find out sometime over a beer what? discussing with the person no doubt but you know the the point is I can't I can't see one single reason why you don't take a stent around the bend the worst well, possible complication in short stents you don't fundamentally disagree with me you fund no no I fundamentally disagree <laughs> no, with the person, the person who made the, the statement person I'm I, talking like, about. This I is completely <laughs> I completely agree with you Aaron 100 percent I'd never you know but I think I can't see why you wouldn't put a long stent in. So the sh a short stent has complications from multiple things, as Aaron's just really well outlined about tenting, straightening, and cutting through the vein wall. The worst possible complication is migration and ending up in the heart. That's a disaster. Mm -hmm. And you just you eliminate all of that by extending the stent around into external iliac vein with, to my mind still, no downside that I can see. If you've got a very, very scarred nivel crossing point, which is what really should only be called May Therner. Compression is not May Therner syndrome. But if you've got a very scarred crossing point, there is potential that that stent will be held in place long enough for it to incorporate. But I still think the behavior of the stents are bad over the long run if you end up with a 60 point down the pelvis, even worse as a 40. I've, I've put in I think in my entire career now, I've put in 160 and we don't even stock them anymore because there's just no real point, you know, so I, I don't, I don't get it, but you know, I'm happy to be convinced by data. No, I mean, that's exactly to the contrary. That's exactly what I think that there's no data. You know, the, the argument, I think that the argument about uh, putting in more metal is some, something that's extrapolated from arterial disease. You know, that, that people have that idea that you don't want to do a full metal jacket, for example, in an SFA. So people are, you know, argue about that is it's, and veins are different. 
Um, yeah. But I'd be interested, uh, Stephen, at some point to get you to debate this individual. So we'll have to think of sure something I'm later. Up for that. Yeah. As long as it's not a debate on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, might, yeah, it might be. It's better that way. You can. Better, you and know. It's better in person. No, Nobody you know, will come to blows. Yeah. I'll tell you that uh, Steve is right. I, I just don't stock them. We, none of us stock them. Mm -hmm. There's no point in stocking short stints. If you need a little bit more, just overlap it more. Plan with your ibis and overlap it yeah. a little bit more above the ligament. But you don't, you, you just don't need to stock short stints. Yeah. I, I would I would also add if if our very first basic principle of medicine is first do no harm, we have found zero problems with extending these stents into the external. And honestly, even if you put a stent in a patient that shouldn't have a stent, that will protect you from having a complication from that in most cases most cases, if it's also sized correctly. Mm. Um, so there's zero downside that any of us can think of for taking that stent properly into the external, but we can all name multiple patients and multiple complications and multiple reasons why not to put a short stent in. So mm. I have yet to hear one argument for why a short stent is better in a vein under a Mayferner. Um, so that, that, that particular debate, I mean, I think, I think honestly you should stage it and all three of us can come up to the microphone and, uh, <laughs> the very bold person can come stand at the other one. <laughs> yeah. That'll be a bloodbath. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anybody's standing on the fence in this one, Kathleen. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, another thing too, to kind of, we'll just go around the panel is, is some words of wisdom for people of how the, how vein stents are different than arterial stents. And that's one of the learning points. So I'll start, um, you know, what, what properties make it different? We just meant, I just mentioned long isn't bad. Whereas with arteries, sometimes we think long's bad. Um, let's talk about how about um, how crossing the ligament is different. Uh, Kush, you know, arteries versus veins. Crossing under the uh, inguinal ligament. Yeah, I mean, I think crossing the ligament and arteries is anathema for many reasons. Um, has been. You, you can do it. Um, but as a venous person, that's someone that doesn't really do arterial disease. I'll tell you that if you don't cross the ligament when you need to, specifically, in a venous disease patient, um, and that's largely going to be post-thrombotics, the occasional acute thrombotic that maybe had the silent DVT years ago, if you don't cross that ligament when you need to in the common femoral vein scar, you're just going to have an included stent, and then you're going to have to deal with it later if you if you have a conscience and try and fix it, which is much harder than just doing it correct the first time. Right. I mean, and this also, I think, goes towards um, what Stephen was saying about mentorship. Like, it, you, you may be treating arterial disease or if you're a cardiologist, coronary disease, and think, oh, I know stents. I know vessels. And I think we've all brought this up. The veins are different. Um, the principles that you use for stenting coronary arteries and, uh, are, you know, peripheral arteries is it's different. And so you need to have a mentor that can teach you those things if you're new to this and you didn't learn it in training. Yeah, I think, I think that's right, Kathleen. The, the, the point here is about appreciating differences about behavior between arteries and veins. So it's not so much that the stents are different, they're designed for veins. And, you know, to the talk you gave early on, we have no data that tells us how strong or how flexible a stent needs to be. There's, there's a lot of hypothesis, but there's no actual data behind it. What you can work out is how things work. And I think the ligament is a, an arterial legacy. The open cell stents in particular have seen really low rates of fracture under the ligament. Um, and, and we know from some experimental data that it's not the ligament, it's the symphysis pubis that is more of an issue anyway. Uh, so as long as you position the stents correctly, and that means no overlap around the ligament, Longer stents again bend better. There's another argument for longer stents. They they are you know, if you play with them on a bench, they bend. A short stent does not bend. It's a rigid tube. So you know they bend better. You place the the overlap a single overlap above the ligament with two stents instead of three. Uh, all those features make make things work better. So I think it's about planning your cases and about thinking about it and about playing with the devices on the table so you know how they behave. And then, you know, working through the upsides and the downsides. I mean, we can't say with any data that a longer stent is better, but we can argue that we've seen far fewer complications to none by extending a stent where you have seen them with shorter stents. I think that's, that's what it teaches you. 
Right, right. Well, we've, uh, I think, had a very robust hour. Hopefully, uh, you, you all got something out of this. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with my three friends um, discussing this. So, uh, and, and thank you to our sponsors for putting this together.